Good evening, I'm Adrian Arsenault. And I'm Andrew Chang. Tonight, the COVID vaccine for younger kids. It's news I've been waiting for and my family's been waiting for. But even if Canada approves it and fast, it won't necessarily mean shots in arms quickly. Why experts say faking a vaccine passport is easier than you think. A dramatic rise in teen vaping. This isn't a fidget spinner phenomenon. This seems to be quite a sticky behavior. The U.S. managed to crack down, so why isn't Canada? And a new look for Alberta's city councils. I hope we have now normalized the idea of women being in positions of leadership. It took us a long time to get here. Calgary's first female mayor on the changing face of politics in Alberta. This is The National. The official request from Pfizer is in. Health Canada is now pouring over safety and efficacy data. And if it checks out, Canadian kids aged 5 to 11 could be approved for the coronavirus vaccine. And that could strike another blow against a virus that still spreads dangerously fast. Children and youth represent by far the biggest chunk of new infections in the country. One reason, while about 72% of the total population is fully vaccinated, the 2.8 million Canadians between the ages of 5 and 11 are ineligible. Their vaccine coverage is 0%. And the prospect of that changing has parents, officials and doctors weighing the next steps. Because as Deanna Sumanak-Johnson explains, even if approval does come swiftly, the vaccine rollout for kids faces some real hurdles. For this family, Pfizer asking Health Canada to approve their vaccine for younger kids felt like one step closer to peace of mind. It's news I've been waiting for and my family's been waiting for for a very long time. Uh, in fact, you know, when my, my son heard about the... Uh, the approvals coming to Canada, he actually cheered, <laughs> and he's nine. Many Canadians share her excitement. A new survey by Angus Reid of 812 Canadian families says about 50% of parents say they will vaccinate their kids as soon as the vaccine is available, but almost a quarter said they would not vaccinate their kids. But protection for another currently unvaccinated demographic could help contain the virus. That means that possibly in the future, instead of having a, a large fifth wave, um, that there could be, you know, slowly an end to this. Even if approved, officials are cautioning against using the existing stock of Pfizer, which was dosed for adults. I think that um, drawing up pediatric doses from the existing vials is not something that is recommended at this point with for a number of reasons. Getting pediatric doses could take until the new year. Despite that, some provinces are hinting they're already planning the rollout. All done. Yes, it certainly is a possibility to have something like a mass vaccine clinic at a school, not necessarily during the school hours. I will say that it will mostly be done by uh, the immunizers that are experienced in providing a uh, vaccine uh, to children in clinics. All of this hinges on Health Canada's approval of data from a vaccine trial that had smaller numbers. The agency is now poring over safety and efficacy data, weighing benefits against risks. The decision thought to be weeks away. Deanna Sumanak Johnson, CBC News, Toronto. Okay, now we've got Dr. Jacqueline Wong joining us, a pediatric infectious diseases specialist at McMaster Children's Hospital. Because, uh, Dr. Wong, how, how urgently do you think parents should be approaching this question of should I get my, my child vaccinated? Right, because we're assuming that, you know, it's going to get approved and it will be safe for use. I think what parents need to consider is what is the risk of this infection to their child, right? Like, does their child have an underlying condition that predisposes them to a more severe outcome? Um, and who else lives with the child? Who else looks after the child? So, you know, what is the importance of preventing an infection in your child, even if it is mild? What is the importance of preventing that infection um, on the, the other household members and family members? And, and if enough kids get the shot, does that get us meaningfully closer to this, I mean, idea we've all heard a, a lot about, herd immunity? 
certainly immunizing children is going to close that gap. But it's important to realize that children throughout the pandemic have not been major drivers of transmission um, throughout the different waves across different countries around the world. And so, you know, even though we can increase the number of people that are uh, immunized, um, it might not translate into significant decreases in transmission or the end of the pandemic. We have to consider global control of this pandemic. We have to consider, you know, waning immunity um, and how the transmission will change going forward. Mm. It's a long road back to normal, that's for sure. Uh, Dr. Wong, thank you so much for your time. The pleasure is mine. Thanks for having me. Starting next month, anyone entering the House of Commons will have to be fully vaccinated. Parliament's governing body, the Board of Internal Economy, announced the requirement. The new rules cover everyone from MPs, their staff and administration. Those with a valid medical exemption will have the option of providing a negative COVID-19 test instead. The Liberals, New Democrats and the Bloc Québécois have all said that they're, all their MPs are fully vaccinated. But so far, the Conservatives have not followed suit. The new rules come into effect when Parliament returns on November 22nd. So proving you're double vaccinated isn't just your ticket into many workplaces now, but restaurants and sports venues too. As Tom Stegel explains, though, one recent case highlights just how easy it can be to fake a vaccine passport. The San Jose Sharks hitting the ice in Montreal without their Canadian-born forward Evander Kane, suspended for handing in a fake COVID vaccination card. We're all disappointed and, and uh, you know, of, uh, you know, how he handled that and, uh, um, you know, the organization's disappointed. The high profile incident raising questions about the prevalence of counterfeits. The Canadian Anti-Fraud Centre says between July and September, it received 18 reports relating to fake proof of vaccination, including websites selling counterfeit cards. Though the centre says in reality, the number is probably much higher. And be using or accepting a piece of paper that has no QR code on it, that has no means of actual validation, then that is easy to falsify. Ontario is rolling out its QR code proof of vaccination program, but is also holding on to its previous system. Meaning businesses here must still accept a paper vaccine receipt without enhanced security. We are going through that right now, but there will be a period of time where people can use both. With that text-based system, experts say names and other data can easily be removed and changed. Forensic document examiner Shabnam Preet Kaur was able to make a real-looking fake in less than five minutes. The government can add a watermark or maybe a colored background so that it becomes a little more difficult for, for people to manipulate it. For Quebecers, QR codes have been the only accepted proof of vaccination for weeks. Alberta is following suit in November, but New Brunswick business owners must still accept documents including photos of immunization records. So the Sharks may not be alone. With a patchwork of vaccine passports, employers could face the prospect of proof of vaccination, maybe no proof at all. Thomas Dagg, CBC News, Toronto. Well, British Columbia is moving to lift capacity limits on gatherings for fully vaccinated people. Effective October 25th, one day after the full vaccine requirement comes into effect, we'll be able to increase to 100 capacity. Venues such as arenas and movie theaters will now be able to reach full capacity as long as people show proof of vaccination. But there will still be restrictions in certain hotspot areas in the province's north, interior and eastern Fraser Valley. Saskatchewan Premier Scott Moe apologized today to those who have been denied health care as the province struggles to manage the fourth wave. Should have the government acted a week or two earlier uh, than, than when we did uh, here in the province with reenacting a number of public health measures? Uh, quite likely we should have in hindsight. Saskatchewan has postponed surgeries and redeployed staff to deal with the record number of COVID-19 patients in its ICUs. At least six patients are being transferred to Ontario. Ontario Premier Doug Ford is facing growing pressure to apologize for his recent comments on immigrants. Critics call them callous, xenophobic and disgraceful. But as Lorinda Redekop shows us, Ford stands by them. 
Gurliv Singh has worked multiple jobs since moving from India to Canada in 2019, picking up extra shifts when he could. Now he wants Doug Ford to apologize. I was really shocked listening to it that uh, how is it possible that we been working so hard, so damn hard, and then listening to such comments from a premier who should actually support immigrants. Yesterday, when speaking about a labor shortage, Ford said he only wanted hardworking people to come to Canada. You come here like every other new Canadian has come here, you work your tail off. If you think you're coming to collect the dole and sit around, not going to happen. Go somewhere else. Today, calls for an apology also came from inside the legislature. Will the Premier apologize for his reckless comments? But the Premier says he has nothing to be sorry about. I am pro-immigration. I have been pro-immigration from day one. Ford says he's hearing messages from immigrants backing him. I'll tell you how Ford Nation was created. They came to this country. They couldn't get a hold of any NDP Liberal leaders, but they got a hold of the Mayor of Toronto. They got a hold of the Premier. This communications specialist tweeted, calling the comments a disgrace. It's ridiculous at any time to say, but to say it on the heels of a pandemic, one day they're pandemic heroes, and then the next day they are potentially freeloaders. All three opposition parties say the Premier needs to apologize. Okay. He had a chance to show some leadership today, instead he doubled down. It doesn't show weakness to apologize when you make a mistake. I think it actually shows strength. Imagine a child of new Canadians hearing their Premier suggesting that they or their parents, family, don't work hard. Like, that's just the wrong message to send. For Gurliv saying an expectation of working hard wasn't what he needed to hear from the Premier. He says it's the norm for himself and his community. Lorenda Radakop, CBC News, Toronto. With the pandemic now cooling off in many parts of the country, teen vaping is heating right back up. And so are the calls for Health Canada to do something. Christine Birak now with the dangers for kids and how the U.S. is successfully cracking down. If you thought vaping might have been a teenage fad, think again. I could count in my hands the number of people who did not vape in my school. It's illegal for kids, but they are hooked. The latest data shows the vaping rate among Canadian and American teens dipped during the pandemic, but it's rebounded. Stunningly, it's now higher on this side of the border, with about 15% of teens reporting they'd vaped in the previous 30 days. Canada still has some of the higher levels of regular use and vaping among kids, so that would be daily vaping or, or uh, vaping almost every day. Marketing and fun flavors enticed kids into inhaling chemicals mixed with nicotine, a highly addictive drug that can harm a developing brain. Companies insist these devices were meant to help adults quit smoking, but experts point out none of them have been submitted to Health Canada as stop smoking aids. I think it's time for the vaping companies to put their money where their mouth is. If this is a smoking cessation product, then prove it and get it approved. In 2019, the U.S. FDA launched a plan to clear the market of unauthorized vape products. Recently, the agency announced it'll permit the sale of one device and one flavor, tobacco. Health Canada is not reviewing individual devices and still considering whether to limit flavors to tobacco, mint and menthol. The data shows pretty clearly that young people like menthol and mint. And so uh, what perhaps this FDA ruling suggests to Health Canada is... When you ban flavors, ban all of the flavors except for tobacco. Provinces have a patchwork of rules, but there are wider restrictions on things like nicotine levels, lifestyle ads, and flavor names that appeal to kids. But in reviewing hundreds of Instagram accounts from vaping suppliers, Health Canada found over half failed to follow the rules. And researchers say teens have easy access. We had a young person, a minor, try to purchase e-cigarettes online. 90% of the situations led to a sale. Lucas Aguiar says he started vaping at 15. Two years later, he's smoking. I started tobacco and I did tobacco for the first time a couple months ago. While these devices could help adult smokers, it's clear they're already harming a new generation. Christine Birak, CBC News, Toronto. Well, Newfoundland and Labrador is introducing a new tax on sugary drinks, the first of its kind in Canada. We did, couldn't collect this tax because everyone was choosing a different low-sugar content drink. That would be a good thing. 
A 20 cent tax per liter will apply to soft drinks, sports drinks, and fruit flavored drinks. It's up for debate in the House of Assembly, and it does face some opposition. Critics say it targets lower income residents and will not reduce consumption. If passed into law, the tax goes into effect in September of next year. Husky Energy now faces three charges for a 2018 spill that released 250,000 liters into the Atlantic Ocean, the largest in Newfoundland and Labrador's history. The industry regulator accuses the company of resuming oil extraction before ensuring it was safe and failing to stop work in time to prevent the spill. Husky was the first company to resume production when the oil field was hit with rough seas. Two new faces will be taking the helm in Alberta's biggest cities, both making electoral history. Julia Wong shows us what these changes mean for Calgary and Edmonton and their relationships with the province. Calgary and Edmonton's next mayors made history Monday night. Amarjeet Sohi becomes the first racialized mayor of Edmonton. Jody Gondek will be the first female mayor in Calgary. I think we have now demonstrated that Calgary understands we are normalizing women in positions of leadership. The pair will lead the most diverse councils either city has ever seen. The overwhelming majority of seats in both Edmonton and Calgary are filled by women and people of color. Diversity is so fundamental for making good decisions. So he, a former federal Liberal cabinet minister, and Gondek, a city councillor since 2017, will both lean progressive in a largely conservative Alberta. The COVID-19 pandemic, the economic downturn, and a federal child care plan are top priorities for both mayors-elect. On the latter, Gondek is clear. If the province cannot strike a deal, she's willing to work with Ottawa directly. I would be interested in working with other mayors across the province to see if that's a model that we can all leverage. Still, both Gondek and Sohi hope they can avoid the same contentious relationships their predecessors had with Alberta Premier Jason Kenney. The message for the Premier is that I'm very interested in building a strong relationship. We haven't always agreed on, uh, on some policy proposals, but I have always been uh, very respectful. For his part, Kenny says... I hope that we can find a collaborative and, po and positive working relationship. In the end, voters just want to see their elected officials get along, says this pollster. There is a sense in this province that we, we've got important tasks in front of us and that we want these governments, uh, levels of government to cooperate. Cooperate, so hopefully there are calmer waters ahead in a strained relationship between the cities and the province. Julia Wong, CBC News. Edmonton. And Calgary's mayor-elect will join us a little later to talk about her priorities, working with the premier and the weight of expectations after making history last night. In Washington, lawmakers are ramping up the stakes as they investigate the January 6th attack on the Capitol. Tonight, a congressional committee is moving forward with plans to hold one of Donald Trump's longtime allies in criminal contempt. Susanna De Silva has the latest on the escalating legal fight. Mr. Chairman, on this vote, there are nine ayes, zero noes. The motion is agreed to. Step one in bringing criminal charges against one of former President Donald Trump's staunchest allies. If other witnesses defy this committee, if they fail to cooperate, we will be back in this room with a new report. The committee tasked with uncovering what, if anything, Trump and his staff knew about plans for the riot on the Capitol recommended Steve Bannon be held in contempt for failing to obey a subpoena to appear last week, He's though experts point out it is a punitive measure. He doesn't get out of it just by saying, OK, now that you've indicted me, uh, I'm going to give the information and, you know, sort of all's good now, right? That's not the way this, the bank robber doesn't get to give the money back. Trump cites executive privilege as a way to stop Bannon's testimony and the flow of information to the committee. He's now filed suit to prevent White House documents from being handed over, calling it, quote, a vexatious illegal fishing expedition. But the former chief counsel to Barack which Obama doesn't believe privilege applies in this case, and it wasn't to designed to cover illegal activity. Those are not the kinds of communications that the executive privilege intends to keep confidential. Last night, the committee responded to Trump's suit in a statement saying public interest outweighs any other arguments, a sentiment echoed by the White House. The former president's actions represented a unique and existential threat to our democracy uh, that we don't feel can be swept under the rug. 
The House of Representatives will now vote on the charge against Bannon before sending it to the Department of Justice for the final decision. Susanna De Silva, CBC News, Washington. There are more details emerging about a group of missionaries and their families abducted in Haiti, including a Canadian citizen and young children. Rafi Bujakanian has the latest on the efforts to free them and reports of a multi-million dollar ransom demand. On the streets, danger and vulnerability are part of daily life. The security situation is dire. Global Medic was in Haiti following the deadly quake in August. Getting help to those who need it meant negotiating with gangs who control territory. They've shut down roads in certain areas and they want your commodity. Now, whether that commodity is the aid you're carrying, your computers, your phones, your money, unfortunately, it seems the commodity is now turning into the people. It's been four days since 17 people affiliated with Christian Aid Ministries were kidnapped. The RCMP would only say it's working with American authorities and the White House. The reason we don't get into operational details is because our objective is to bring them home. There are reports the gang has demanded a $17 million ransom. A source with knowledge of the situation told CBC News the kidnapped Canadian is an adult. Five children are among the hostages, one just eight months old. Negotiators may try and use that to their advantage, says this expert. Really, that, that child could be uh, a, a liability to the, to the kidnappers. And then you could you could work on something in terms of good faith, you know, release the uh, child and we can start working on 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 uh, on getting the the, uh, the money. With hundreds of gang kidnappings a year, though, advocates worry about a chilling effect. I'm concerned that uh, uh, missionaries and other group uh, that are there to help would be very um, tentative to keep on doing what they've been doing for years because those are the people that are really making a difference in a lot of uh, Asians uh, in Haiti. Both Ottawa and Washington advise against what they call non-essential travel to Haiti. Global Affairs says it's in touch with the family of the Canadian who is among the abducted. Rafi Bujikani in CBC News, Ottawa. Well, rescues are underway in India after days of torrential rain and intense flooding. Next, the desperate measures on the ground and the concern this could be the new normal. A giant puppet of a little Syrian girl arrives in England to help send a message. It certainly sheds a light on the plight and on the journey. And the battle over coal mining in the Rockies. This fight's not over. <laughs> we won't let this die. We're back in two. Incredible images out of Texas this morning where a plane with 21 people on board crashed before it could take off. Amazingly, everyone was able to escape the wreckage on their own before it caught fire. There were no serious injuries. We're always uh, expecting the worst but hoping for the best. And today, we absolutely positively got the best outcome we could hope for on this incident. Authorities say the plane never made it off the ground. It just rolled down the runway and struck a fence. Officials are investigating. Well, the death toll continues to climb in parts of India after heavy rains triggered flash floods and landslides in several areas. Salima Shivji now with the damage and why some fear it is only the beginning. After days of pounding rain, the destruction was swift. The reaction helpless. Homes completely battered by the torrential rain and flash floods hitting Kerala over such a short period. Some residents only had minutes to run for their lives. The water burst into my house at night. All of our stuff is lost, this man says. We only have the clothes on our backs. Rescue efforts are ongoing with the Indian military deployed. At least two dozen people have died and many others are missing. And uh, one family completely lost six members of the family. Rivers across Kerala so swollen that officials have evacuated thousands of people. The threat of landslides is ever present. There are four, five shops here. This is totally uh, washed out. Washed out. 
Even as some make do and carry on with their plans, this inventive couple took a cooking pot to get to their wedding venue. It was also flooded, but that didn't stop the celebrations or local news filming. Other parts of India are also suffering, gushing waters trapping people inside, forcing the army to step in. This is record-breaking rain outside of the usual monsoon season, and climate experts say this is the new normal, with the Arabian Sea warming at an alarming rate faster than other oceans, trapping more moisture. We cannot do anything about increasing rainfall. We cannot stop that. So the, one, the immediate step is to adapt and then uh, go for mitigation uh, strategies to avoid the disaster. Strategies like an efficient warning system for locals to leave fast before the rains hit. For now, the waters have eased somewhat, but there's little reprieve, with more heavy rain in the forecast. Salima Shivji, CBC News, Vancouver. The British government wants to crack down on asylum seekers. It is considering a new law that would, among other things, criminalize some of them. And as that debate rages, today a visitor arrives casting a giant spotlight on the issue. Margaret Evans explains. To England's shores comes little Amal, the huge puppet of a nine-year-old Syrian girl, helped along by the wind and a theater community seeking to represent the plight of refugee children. She's already traversed much of Europe, from Turkey to the Vatican. This latest leg crossing the English Channel, a reminder of the risks many face. Waiting to greet her, the children of Folkestone, clearly enchanted, along with the actor Jude Law, also enchanted. To be here on the shores of the UK, my home, and be asked to welcome them, her, little Amal, just seemed um, a real honour, actually. Her arrival coincides with an increasingly heated debate in the United Kingdom over asylum laws. More than 17,000 asylum seekers have arrived along the English coastline from France this year, mainly in small boats. The British Home Secretary, Priti Patel, plans to introduce tough new laws to stop them, including legal cover for the border force to turn boats around. France is a safe country, not one riven by war or conflict. There is no reason why any asylum seeker should come to the United Kingdom directly from France. Human rights campaigners say it will contradict international law. Priti Patel's position is this country will not accept its responsibilities and requires others who are already taking, in some cases, far more responsibility than us. It will demand that they should take more. Supporters of the Amal project say it's aimed at changing the conversation. It certainly sheds a light on the plight and on the journey. So that refugees and migrants are seen as real people. And it's taken a larger-than-life puppet to do it. Margaret Evans, CBC News, Hoaxton. Well, next, a political battle over the future of an iconic Canadian landscape. It's the wrong thing to do, and people know that. We'll hear from both sides of the fight over coal mining in the Rockies. And later, the moment an amateur diver stumbled upon an ancient underwater rock. We will be back. There is treasure buried in Alberta's Rocky Mountains, and the province wants it. For more than 40 years, most of the Rockies have been protected from open pit coal mining, but that could soon change. And as Alison Dempster explains, Albertans have a lot to say about it. Coal mining could be coming to these Alberta foothills, where rangeland meets the Rockies, and ranchers round up their cattle each fall, an iconic landscape that is now a political battleground. Should full-fledged coal uh, development occur in this area and surface mining, um, we won't be here. Laura Lang and John Smith graze their cattle on the hardy native grasses that grow here in the Rocky Mountain foothills. As the province develops a new coal policy, they worry about what the future holds for this landscape and all the industries and communities that depend on it. So we can't stack, continue to stack resources onto these special places and expect them 
to thrive. We've had cattle grazing here and before cattle there were bison grazing up here. It's sustainable, it's manageable. We care for the land and you, we, we do that amongst other resource development right now as well as recreation, tourism, uh, the filming industry. Uh, there's a lot that happens up here. For the past seven months, Ron Wallace has been talking to Albertans about what a new coal policy should look like. He's the head of a panel that will make recommendations to the provincial government next month. There are Albertans standing up saying, listen to us. And that's the thing that struck me the, the most, is that these, if you're going to make major decisions like this that are effectively at this Alberta crossroads, where there's no going back once you make some of these decisions, uh, then you had better talk to people in advance. That You cannot make these kinds of decisions in a vacuum. The Alberta government attempted to do just that last year. On a Friday before the May long weekend, it quietly put out a notice that it was revoking a long-standing coal policy that protected much of the eastern slopes of the Rocky Mountains from open pit coal mining. A landmass the size of Jamaica was no longer off limits, including Cabin Ridge Mountain. It's a historic landmark for ranchers in this area, named after a homestead that's been in the Blades family for a century. A touchstone for a way of life deeply connected to the foothills. They aren't making any more mountains, and there isn't very much of this kind of country left. They have a greater full time on this road, and they can't keep the road smooth. Mac and Rini Blades say they started seeing mining exploration activity as soon as the government rolled back the restrictions. Companies with newly issued permits put in roads and started drilling core samples, sizing up finds they describe as potentially world class. It's the wrong thing to do and people know that. They don't want the mountains destroyed because you can never reclaim a mountain. And it's a source of a lot of water if people only understood how the mountains hold the water and let it out slowly so the rivers run all year round, not just in the spring when the snow melts. The exploration companies drilling in the area are looking for the kind of coal used to make steel. It would be exported mostly to Asian markets. The Premier says coal is not going away and Alberta could use the investment. Unless you're living in a mud hut, metaphorically speaking, if you are part of the modern economy, then you depend on steel and steel depends on metallurgical coal, and that coal has to be developed from somewhere. But a broad coalition of conservationists, country artists, and indigenous activists is fighting to make sure that somewhere is not the eastern slopes of the Rocky Mountains. They put so much political pressure on the government, it had to backtrack. The province reinstated the old coal policy earlier this year, putting the brakes on new exploration activity, at least for now. Atrum, one of the companies exploring in the area, says in a statement that a future policy should be balanced, embracing strong environmental regulation with the ability to create responsible resource development. It's all meant a frustrating kind of limbo for many in the Crow's Nest Pass. At a local coffee shop, there's no shortage of opinion on the prospect of reviving the industry. It's just so uh, rooted in our history. I mean, we've got 120 years of mining history that everybody's dad or grandpa worked in the mine or still works in the mines in BC. I can't believe that they would do anything other than to say it's just not a good idea, not on the eastern slopes of the Rocky Mountains because that's our water tower. What, what reason has young people got to stay here? I mean, you only could have so many tour guides. <laughs> At an industrial park, welders rebuild coal mining equipment used across the border in B.C. James Arbuckle is eager to expand his business. He says Crow's Nest Pass could use the much-needed jobs more mining activity would bring. I think just to prosper, you know, people enjoying life. And you can when you have a job and income coming in, and if it means a coal mine does that, then that's what it is. That sentiment echoed by the mayor of Crow's Nest Pass. I really want to see our, our community grow and be vibrant. And um, uh, we don't have other industries pounding our door down to, to set up shop here. Back at the Roundup, ranchers say they trust the Coal Policy Committee is listening to their concerns, but they question whether the final report will make any difference with the government. Trust was broken pretty significantly throughout this whole process. So 
it's hard to trust the process at all. So I'm really hopeful with people, pressure, and um, good science behind it. I'm really hoping they do the right thing. If they don't, this fight's not over. <laughs> we won't let this die. I, I, I might die on this mountain fighting for it because <laughs> it, it's important to keep it together, you know, for the next generations. For more than four decades, this stretch of the Rocky Mountains has been protected from open pit coal mining, a legacy that is now uncertain. Allison Dempster, CBC News, in the Rocky Mountain foothills. Next, we're going to stay in Alberta with Calgary's new mayor-elect. We'll talk to Jody Gondek about making history, the challenges ahead for her and her city, and a personal source of political inspiration for that. Our conversation next. Thank you, Calgary, with all of my heart. Thank you for engaging in democracy and sending a clear signal about what our future looks like. History was made in Calgary last night as Jyoti Gondek was elected as the city's first ever female mayor. 27 candidates were vying for the top job, but Gondek won by an impressive margin of nearly 60,000 votes. And to talk about what Calgary's future will look like, mayor like Jyoti Gondek joins us now. Hello, congratulations. I, I know you have heard all day, Mayor-elect, the notion of you have made history. A and I wonder what that feels like, what the weight of expectation is of that label. Well, thanks so much for having me on. This is incredibly exciting. The weight of that label, as you said, is heavy. Um, however, I hope we have now normalized the idea of women being in positions of leadership. It took us a long time to get here, but now that we're here, let's keep moving forward. So this is not an easy time for your city. I mean, obviously there's COVID, uh, there's a vacancy rate of what, 30% in downtown offices, all the job losses in the oil sector. When you have to sit down once you're sworn in next week, what, what do you consider your priority? You know, there's a lot of stuff facing Calgary and um, I'm choosing to look at next week as a huge opportunity to pull together a team that can rally around a common vision. When we talk about COVID though, what, what's your sense? How has the province handled COVID from your perspective? Well, I think pandemic management has been something that's um, not been our greatest strength as a province. And I think there was hesitation early on from the province to put in too many restrictions. I think they felt that people would be worried about their freedoms. And I would encourage members of the provincial government who are perhaps uh, afraid to take a more cautious approach to, to not be that way. Um, you can band with us who are in municipalities telling you that citizens will accept pandemic mitigation if it means that we stay safer and we are able to come into recovery sooner. I, I watched on Twitter today, uh, the Premier Jason Kenney sent out a congratulations. You sent out a note saying, I look forward to working with you. How important is it that that relationship work? Because it seemed very difficult with Mayor Nenshi. You know, he referred to the Kenny government as the most incompetent he's ever seen. You know, we have all been critical of each other. That is something that um, we tend to do. Um, but I think what's really important is to focus on what Calgarians and Albertans need. And uh, we really need a little bit of positivity and a focus on how we recover. And we can't do that without our provincial partners. So I'm very interested in making sure that they understand our need for childcare spaces, a strong public health network, and access to great affordable housing for all Calgarians. And we, in turn, will drive that economic engine uh, that we have been able to do as a city. So it's got to be a partnership. One last thought. I, I, I've heard you say that your dad in inspired you to enter public service. I have no doubt you've been thinking about him a lot in the last few days. And in, in the last day in particular, is, is there something you said to him in your head that you would have wanted to say to him about what you've just accomplished? Yeah, um, I'm going to try to do this without choking up. He used to ask me to make sure that I, I stayed politically engaged. And I remember as a kid saying, oh, dad, I'm not into politics. And when he passed away in 2003, quite unexpectedly, I remember looking through his papers and seeing that he had started two projects. Um, one was to talk about the role of religion and how you explain it to young children. 
And the other was to include Punjabi as a second language option in the Calgary Board of Education programming. And when I saw that he hadn't finished those projects, I called his friends and uh, people in the community. I said, would you like me to take his place? And they said, we would love that. And that's what taught me the significance of what he meant by get politically engaged. What he meant was serve your community to the best of your ability. So that's what I did. I'm sure he'd be very proud of you right now. I Mayor, think he would. Mayor elect, thank you so much. Best of luck to you. Thank you very much. Well, Toronto's Royal Ontario Museum is about to open a brand new art exhibit. It captures the experience and the emotions of the pandemic through some of the youngest artists to live through it, children and teens. I'm Alameen Abdul Mahmoud. Iqaluit is in a state of emergency after fuel was found in the city's water supply. Tomorrow on CBC's daily news podcast, Frontburner, how this crisis is connected to climate change. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Hi there, it's Selin. Well, I hope you'll join me in Las Vegas at my brand new show at Resorts World this coming November. Well, Celine Dion's brand new residency in Las Vegas will not be going on for now. The Canadian singer is postponing her shows due to severe and persistent muscle spasms. Dion says she is heartbroken but has to focus on getting better. Well, the pandemic is seen as a moment that will define a generation. And last spring, Toronto's Royal Ontario Museum asked young people to express their feelings through a work of art in any medium. The result is a new exhibit of special memories and strong emotions. Talia Ricci gives us a tour. At first glance, they may seem like whimsical children's drawings, but a closer look reveals more. The emotions young people have been carrying during the pandemic. The most common uh, emotion expressed with blue is sadness, but rather than expressing sadness with it, I wanted to uh, express confusion. Toronto's Royal Ontario Museum received more than 2,000 submissions for the exhibition My Pandemic Story, with mediums ranging from spoken word to dance and painting. Salsabel Mazumber's piece is digital art. During the pandemic, I had a lot of time to be by myself, so I did a lot of self-reflection. I really saw myself through the mirror as a boy wearing a woman's costume. This is my pandemic story submission. This is the coronavirus, and it ate all my favorite things, like school, traveling, basketball, and birthday parties. The ROM says this is its first crowdsource exhibition and one of the few pandemic-related exhibitions worldwide to focus on children's perspectives. We got excited about hearing the voices of, of uh, children through their experiences. We really saw people kind of working through a lot of their issues. Hannah Choi says her experience was difficult to put into words. Art helped capture it. My friends and family seemed so close to me, almost as if I could literally like reach through my screen and touch them. But that really isn't the case. Mazumber says seeing their art on display in a museum feels surreal. If there are other kids and teens coming to see this exhibition, they may be able to see a part of themselves within any of these art pieces made by kids for kids. And hoping their pieces bring others comfort. Talia Ricci, CBC News, Toronto. Good for them. Still ahead, an incredible find pulled from the Mediterranean Sea. And it was amazing, amazing to see a beautiful sword like this. Who historians believe may have once owned this sword nearly a thousand years ago. Next. Well, some days you might find a pretty rock at the beach. Others take a more interesting turn, like the day a diver plucked this ancient sword from the Mediterranean Sea. So a rare find, absolutely an old one too, obviously, but what is perhaps most interesting about this weapon is who experts think may have once owned it. The discovery and all the details are our moment tonight. The divers spotted the meter long iron sword in the waters off Northern Israel, laying on the seabed with a trove of other ancient artifacts. Worried the sand would shift and the discovery be lost, he grabbed it. The reaction from experts, wow. And it was amazing, amazing to see 
a beautiful sword like this. They think it likely belonged to a crusader 900 years ago. We're assuming right now, because it's the beginning of the research, we have to clean it. Maybe there is a name. Israel's Antiquities Authority says it will eventually go on display, a testament to history and to the person who once wielded it. I'm trying to imagine him on the field uh, with all the armor on, uh, on him and the sword and fighting with it. Maybe they were bigger than us uh, today, but definitely stronger. <laughs> so, so as you say, I mean, he's turning it over, right, for yes, cleaning and analysis. But it's not like he walks away empty-handed. He gets a, a certificate of appreciation out of it and, of course, the experience of having found it. And he gave people an idea. The diver found this about 150 meters offshore and only about 15, uh, five meters of water. It's mm. very close. That is the National for October the 19th. Good night. Good night.